Okay. <laughs> All right, I think we're live. Cause he's zero 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 six. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this wonderful new panel called "Trust Is a New Normal." And I'm very excited to have uh, with me uh, Ryan Rugg from R3. Say hi, Ryan. Nice to meet you. And uh, Madeline Bailey from Valentine Consultancy, and previously at Amos Allen. Say hi. hi <laughs> Christoph Radici from uh, Rexio, say hi. Hey guys. And last but not least, Jack Prescott from MTech Capital. Hi everyone. Hi. Um, guys, I propose we kick it off straight away and Madeline, no pressure, but could you explain to us what is trust in the insurance industry? And also what does a policy actually mean? You know, thanks, Waleed. It's a really, really great question. Um, and I think when most people think about insurance, you're probably thinking about your motor insurance or your home insurance. But actually, insurance is a very, very um, complex and sophisticated class of financial products. Um, ultimately, when I think of trust within insurance, um, I'm thinking about an insur insurance company's promise to pay um, when, an, when a policyholder suffers a loss. Um, and and of course, when we think around the, the broader insurance market, you've got uh, personal lines insurance. So that's, again, your homes, your cars, et cetera. And you're moving into much more. <laughs> uh, we've lost you there, Madeline. <laughs> um, until now, Madeline... Just... oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, there you go. Did, yes. did I cut you off for a bit? Yes, yeah, yeah. so we're talking about personal lines. <laughs> Is it me? I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's insurance. It's because it's insurance. It's cursed me. Um, and I think my point I want to make really is that the point of insurance is to spread concentrated risk. So the industry is built around products that really serve society by spreading risk and therefore, and, and therefore helping to manage concentrated risk exposures. And so it means paying out in wherever you are in the spectrum of insurance when you suffer a loss. Excellent. And I'm curious to get your also your insights in terms of how does trust change between the perspective of a consumer and an insurer, or reinsurer, or even an enterprise? Or is it fundamentally still the same thing, would you say? Well, I, th I think it's fundamentally the same thing. I think the more sophisticated buyers um, are, are, will have much more sophisticated products. And so in the, it, I think that they are probably, they are structured in more complex ways. But ultimately, you're looking for a payout for an insured event uh, when, when you suffer a loss. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Now, Jack, um, could you tell us you know, two words you know, on um, MTech Capital, but also you know, from your perspective, um, you know, how does the insurance sector uh, look and deal with trust? Because you, you have hindsight, hindsight view, sorry, on the InsurTech community, but also insurance in general. Yeah, so um, we're an in, uh, insurance tech focused venture capital fund. So we, we invest in early stage technology companies in this industry. And um, what we've seen a lot from, you know, both our portfolios, companies and companies that we interact with is that they are trying to solve issues of trust in the insurance industry in a few different ways. Um, one of the ones that's probably most uh, critical and has come to, to light most recently is what happens um, in the event of uh, what you think should be a claim uh, that doesn't actually pay out to go back to, to Madeline's point. Um, for example, COVID-19, there's been a lot of issues with businesses covered under, uh, businesses having business disruption policies that cover them in the event of, you know, their store being broken into, being flooded, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they, they haven't been covered for COVID-19 and lots of small businesses Action lawsuits against their insurers, uh, Hiscox in particular, has suffered from this. And I think that's really interesting to look at how insure tech companies are responding to that and to that lack of trust in the established players in the market. And I think one of the things that we've seen from a technology perspective is uh, the rise of parametric insurance products that seek to find an external um, reference point that, um, that determines the payout uh, ahead of time and so you kind of remove the trust from the equation by saying if you know if your property floods and the water reaches this level then we pay no matter what and we don't go through the process of 
assessing the claim, seeing how much we lost. It's a pure linear relationship. So I think that's one of the ways we've seen where people are responding from early stage companies are responding to what they see as problems of trust in the insurance industry. And do you believe there's an opportunity for the venture capitalist industry and investors in general to, to use trust as a criteria for investing in intratech? So basically, how likely is an intratech here to abide by certain trust and perhaps transparency values? Yeah, so I think it is consumer attitudes towards incumbent insurance companies are generally quite negative and so there isn't a lot uh, in some industries you're really trying to overcome a barrier where there's a trusted incumbent and people aren't willing to bet on an early stage company with you know they're not willing to write a policy with them and in insurance um that's all potentially less true because the you know, attitudes towards the incumbent providers isn't very good and so people are willing to uh, experiment with what they see as being a more digital, more transparent option. Uh, and that is really what a lot of the um, successful insured that companies have led with. And, you know, the IPO of companies like Lemonade um, has really been an endorsement of that. Uh, they are very focused on transparency in the claims process um, and even in the way that they underwrite um, in a way that other insurance companies haven't. And so there's this gap that has emerged from the lack of trust and the incumbents that ensure tax are kind of rushed to fill. Excellent. Now, Ryan, if you could tell us, you know, a few words, you know, about R3, but also tell us, you know, from your perspective, how can technology, you know, facilitate or be an enabler of trust? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Lily. So, you know, R3 is an enterprise blockchain company. You know, we started back in 2015 as originally a consortium of different banks and insurers that were working together on you know, blockchain solutions. Um, then in 2017, we released our platform called Porta. We have an open source version and an enterprise version. And really the reason you know, our CTO jokes, it would have been a lot cheaper and easier just to you know, use one of the other protocols out there, but due to like privacy and scalability, there was none of them that were really fit for purpose based on our ecosystems kind of, you know, kind of requirements and trust was one of it, right? And like privacy was kind of key. So, you know, within SureTax in 2017, Molly, as you know, we opened this up excellence for insurers and reinsurers with Accord. And we really saw a massive kind of adoption and migration from other platforms. And it's really because, you know, in what we want to call like a trustless society, it's like privacy is so key and sharing data with untrusted parties was like, you know, in an emerging tech was new to them. So, you know, kind of evolving on that. But I think that then, you know, enabling technology to kind of help bring back that trust and you know, break down those silos has been really powerful for a lot of insurers. Thank you. Um, now, Christoph, if you could tell us, you know, two words on, on Rexio, but also tell us from an InsurTech point of view, are you addressing perhaps the lack of trust that the incumbents are have been penalized during this pandemic area? And how are you doing it? Yeah, so Rexio is a platform that has this one uh, ultimate aim to bring trust um, to people who didn't have that uh, platform for remote interactions uh, prior to, to Rexio being introduced. Um, trust was typically confined to either your um, um, company uh, infrastructure, your IT infrastructure, or your um, physical uh, proximity and, and people who you interact with. Um, the recent situation globally has changed uh, the entire uh, perception of trust. We were suddenly confined to our uh, four walls we had to stay at home. We had to find new ways to uh, trust, inter tra interact in a trustworthy way with people um, all over the globe. And uh, we found, we believe we found a solution that is exactly doing that. So Rexio basically uh, extends trust beyond your, uh, beyond your infrastructure, beyond your four walls, beyond your physical proximity. We think that we, we call it a blanket of trust for, for data and for interactions with, uh, with people and businesses together. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. Sorry, I was pressing the mute button and I don't mute too many times. Um, so um, my question to, to all of you is that um, trust is based on, I would say, three principles. And I'd like to get your view as a panel on, on how well does the insurance industry do on each of them. And one of those principles is you need to have a solution to a customer problem. As you know, the insurance industry has been plagued by and accused of being not very customer centric. The second element is you need to fulfill the promise of solving that problem. 
And the third is you need to deliver that solution um, in an honest and transparent manner. How well does the insurance industry do on all three? I'll take off with an example of um, a project where those were the kind of uh, issues we were trying to answer, if that's helpful. Um, and I think Ryan will be able to jump in because she'll be familiar with it. Um, so in, in, in the marine insurance um, space um, at MS Amlin, we collaborated with a number of other brokers and insurers with um, Maersk, the global shipping company, to help them look at how they could use uh, blockchain in particular, but but a digital solution to help it manage the exposure of all the ships that it owns and, and manages that transport um, goods around the world. Um, and um, one of the one one of the kind of talking points that we always spoke about was we wanted to bring the risk closer to the capital that was underwriting the risk. Um, and, and in commercial insurance, you'll often hear people say, well, 40% of my premium, which is the money you pay for your insurance policy to, 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 to buy the product, 40% of what I'm paying is not even bearing on the risk. And, and so what, what most did was they pulled out their main um, program, their whole program, which is the insurance program that protects all those, those ships, um, and they took it to a different insurer and a different broker with a digital program wrapped around that. It was blockchain based, um, whereby they could digitize all that risk and asset data and have re a real time view of the exposure of every single vessel in its fleet. So to, to my mind, that was a really good, it is a really good example, it's still ongoing, of working with a very sophisticated insurance buyer and working to solve the problem directly with them rather than just treating them as something at the end of a payment. Yeah. I also think that when we are talking about interactions between normal people and insurance companies, we had we have had this perception of stronger partner enforcing their vision of trust, their uh, perception of trust onto the weaker one. What they believed was trustworthy was in fact so, and uh, you, were, you were the one who had to prove otherwise. If we can now move away from that model and we introduce a trustless ecosystem where parties do not have to start with a form of trust relationship but can have technology backing that, that redefines how those parties are going to interact. That redefines how people are going to perceive insurance companies and how they are going to see their future interactions with them. Yeah, and to add on to like Madeline and Chris, you know, I think originally these consortiums of insurers that came together and surely d3i Ristry, i don't think necessarily the insurers like wanted to work with one another or, like nor trust each other right necessarily but you know due to expense ratios like Alan said being so high you know anywhere from 30 to 40 percent it's like how can they you know increase their roi and how can they do it so coming together with you know and allowing technology to enable that kind of trust element to bring like you know encryption into it where you could have you know, an immutable record where anyone can see it on the entire network really brought like a, a vote of confidence. And I think that's really, technology has kind of enabled this trust and trustless ecosystems. Great, and, and Ryan, whilst, whilst you're here, I want to take a, a question from the audience here from Rachel Heroff, basically saying, do you think big insurance, big insurance firms are really ready for solutions in blockchain tech? Love to get your views on that. Yeah, it's it's been a journey, you know? <laughs> yes. I, it's been a journey, it's like, a lot of these large enterprise companies like are still kind of going through the cloud transformation. So, you know, working with these architects to deploy like nodes in the cloud or nodes on prem, it's been and getting through the chief information security offices. It's been an education process. You know, it hasn't it's been more on the not less on the tech side, more on the governance and standards and you know, to actually enable these large enterprise companies to move um, at a faster rate, you know. So it's are they ready? They're getting ready. We'll put it that way. <laughs> you know, as very, you know, and I, I'll, 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 nice I'll, I'll add some color to that because it isn't just a cultural or leadership issue. I think that there are some aspects of uh, insurance because it is a regulated industry that we, that the, the the big insurance companies have to be mindful of, and this whole idea around um, trusting the data and uh, and the and uh, trusting in the crypto cryptography of the data um, and and all these new ways of um, structuring how data flows and who can see it, I think aren't easy questions to answer when you're in a regulated environment. I think it's going to get there, absolutely, but it's going to be a slower journey because of it. 
Um, if I can jump in there with an anecdote, um, we met a company recently who we'd been tracking for a little while and, you know, they presented their pitch deck and probably two years ago when we met them, they had pitched themselves the blockchain company that they were using distributed ledger technology, yada, yada, yada. Uh, all the underlying technology they use is still the same. They've just taken all of that out of their deck. Uh, they're no longer marketing themselves as a, as a DLT company yeah. uh, and they think that there is almost some element of fatigue among their clients, both in insurance and in some other industries like banking, um, about, you know, th there was a lot of hype about this a few years ago. Uh, they're still selling the same vision, which is, you know, greater collaboration, both within the enterprise using blockchain, but across different enterprises. Um, but they, they, I think they found that the, the term blockchain has become a bit of an albatross around their neck. So, uh, I think there's probably some people in big insurance firms who say who are saying they don't want to know at the moment. Yeah. It is a little bit of a uh, you know marmite kind of situation. You either love it or hate it. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who don't like it, and those who think they understand it actually have not much of an understanding of what blockchain actually is. But again, it's about having a business case that can be resolved by blockchain. You don't start with blockchain. You don't start with I have the internet for you to resolve your issues. I have, this is my problem. Let's see what is the right tool. Um, but coming back if, to, the, um, to the trust element and whether or not, you know, it has evolved, you know, in this post or soon, hopefully post pandemic area is that during the lockdown, you know, we've moved from physical interactions to digital one. I mean, especially in the Lloyd's market, it's very much about, you know, this personal relationship you have on one -on one how has that impacted the insurance industry to build trust? And what tools have been used to breed trust? For example, are we, are we using increasing amount of social media? Are we using wisdom of the crowd? W what is your view on the kind of digital tools that are being used now to build trust? Well, uh, we see lots of um, social media presence and uh, tr trying to position yourself as a company over social, social media and um, your um, so social responsibility, your, you addressing uh, the needs of the little man. But I think um, what is missing is not just saying, talking about it, but also showing and giving the tech that is also uh, proving that you really are doing something uh, in that direction. So definitely um, right now we should stop just uh, posting and um, telling what we want to change and start changing that in, in, from the company's perspective, from the corporation's perspective. Yeah. And, and I, I totally agree and I'll add to that. And I've, I've, I've read so many articles that have said that the, the way that all industries, not just insurance, have responded to COVID-19 hasn't really been a techno technological issue, it's been a cultural issue. And just by force of having to work in different ways, people have been forced to, to find new ways of of working and and for the most part i think it's worked for most people and 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 of course the coronavirus has had a horrible economic impact for many 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 people personally and and at a business level but at the same time i think for the most part people have have rallied and i think i think the the actual way to get work done hasn't been as impacted as what people thought it would have been pre covid 19. i think um from what we've seen uh there's been a lot of talk in the industry, uh, uh, as Christoph says, about digital transformation for the last three years, and it's uh, the industry's had it, had it, had um, that forced upon them as a result of COVID-19. And speaking from the experience of our portfolio companies, lots of them had been in conversations with insurers for two years or so about you know using a new machine learning solution, buying cloud technology for the first time. And, you know, in March, once they all had to work from home, those questions suddenly went away and it became a bit of a no brainer. Um, and so we saw a real acceleration in adoption as a result of this. And uh, people were, were finally uh, forced to put their money where their mouth is. Uh, mouth is. We'll be, it'll be interesting to see whether this is a one off thing. And next year, you know, this is this is kind of the beginning um, of a new area, a new era, or if they go back to dragging their feet in a year's time, but we will see. We will see. Let's think about the consequences of this situation 20, 30 years ago without this technology we have today. We should embrace tech because it gives us tools to withstand problems like you see nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, um, blockchain is not maybe the uh, answer to all the problems, uh, but it can shift our interactions 
into a safer zone and situation like today. Yeah, Ryan, you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. You know, I, we've seen kind of COVID be almost a stimulant to a lot of these like, companies wanting to like digitize the whole, all their workflows in a secure way, right? And how do you share data? And they have more data than they've ever had before. And how do you kind of organize it and you know connect these disparate parties together in a trusted way? And you know, blockchain DLT, albeit I agree with like Jack, has been you know they want a solution. They don't really care what the underlying technology is at this point. It's like they just want solutions. And like, how can like a lot of like the BAU has been affected by COVID, and it's like how can they take these you know pools of data and share them with disparate parties that are working from home? You know, there's more data than ever before, and you know, so it's like it's definitely a lot of these industries. And from my perspective also, it's like these industries are starting to converge, which is really interesting also. It's not just, you know, the insurers. It's like, you know, working with the large telcos that want to run these networks and 5G and it's working with, you know, in you know supply chain and, you know, with insure ways that they were doing. It's like, you're starting to see all these kind of industries come together, which is really fascinating for me also. So let me be a little bit controversial um, because on the theme of digital transformation and trust is saying it works quite well is that, what the pandemic has shown is that the insurance industry is competent at working from home, at using Zoom and using Teams. But in terms of digital transformation, there's been zero improvement. What do you guys think? You know, from my perspective, that you know, looking at some of the consortium work that they're doing, like they're still in like the top of deployment. Like they're still working, you know, with all of these like large, you know, security aspects of different firms, cybersecurity, and pushing forward to get everything kind of launched and live. So. It may have slowed it down just because, you know, right now everyone's making sure that they can maintain their, you know, business and not necessarily accelerate the transformation, but they're still focused on it. It's just yeah. been a slower pace. And like, you know, I think in general, you know, Zooms and WebExes and all these things are great, but it, in general, it slows down the pace because instead of being able to, you know, have a water cooler conversation for five minutes, it's like you have to have a 15, 30 minute Zoom call, you know, so yes. you get to yeah. slow down the process. And I think just just from the projects I've been working on in the uh, in the commercial space, I think those end buyers who are really driving the change, I think um, th they're the ones who are going to really reap the benefits of things like moving towards real time risk management and and the real innovative products and services that they can demand and and that can be utilised through emerging technology. So I think those who are on the front foot will definitely be reaping the rewards further down the track, and it's and it's. And it's only good for the for the buyer of the product at the end of the day. Um, the other thing I was going to say was somebody mentioned the business interruption um, high court case in the UK. The judgment yeah. came down today in favour of policyholders. Yes. So you know, at, at least that's a good a good sense of where the courts are are um, coming out in favour of of the consumer. Indeed. And also maybe to go back to your example, Walid. Um, Zoom is again this trust within the organization. If you're using online meetings, if you're working from home, but within the organization, it's very easy to maintain trust. But we are talking about a situation when you have to onboard onto this trust train people who are not part of your company, your organization. So that's where technology that we're discussing today can help us bring that to the masses, not just to confine to your IT infrastructure. Indeed. So Thank we you. got six and a half minutes left before the end of the session. So you, the audience, if you've got any questions, you know, follow Rachel's lead and uh, ask a, a question in the chat box on the right. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the panel, um, in, for the last question I've got for you is with the end of the pandemic, what do you expect to happen? Are we going to go back to the old ways? Are we going to continue adopting digital tools and see how we can build new digital processes with digital mindsets? Or do you believe it's going to be a bit of a hybrid of, of the both? There's no going back to the old ways, uh, not just because of uh, um, the next pandemic that's going to come, but because people have just gotten accustomed to comfort of remote interactions, of trust, not just being enforced by physical presence, but also being able to do some government uh, issues and solve government problems remotely just by uh, mailing or sending documents online. So when we see that, we can finally become masters of our own time and not just try and fit into your uh, government or your uh, insurance company schedule, that opens a whole new uh, chapter for us, a chapter where we can detach time and presence, physical presence, and yet retain that trust that we so long for. I, I completely agree. There's absolutely no going back. 
Um, and I think, you know, even the insurance markets are realizing this. Um, Lloyd's, for example, for any new entrants who want to come into Lloyd's and um, start their own syndicate and bring in underwriting capital into the market, you have to demonstrably show that you've got something accretive and innovative. Um, otherwise, you, you won't get, be given permission to, to, to come into the market and, and underwrite risk. So I, I think there's absolutely no going back. Great. Yeah. Ryan? <laughs> no, I was going to say, I, I agree with, you know, it's just you've seen these like large ecosystems want to collaborate, want to share information, enabling technology. It's like you're starting to see these technologies converge also, which is really interesting. It's like, you know, people are utilizing our platforms, you know, like kind of like the fundamental block to have the data, but then applying AI and telematics to really create new products out of it, new revenue lines. So like use of data insurance and other kind of new innovative models to really kind of create and generate new revenue. Jack? Yeah, I would, I would agree. I think, um, you know, to come back to something I said before, uh, the insurance companies have adopted technology for the first time. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety about that kind of zero to one moment where you decide, oh, we're going to go to the cloud. Um, and uh, once you've done it, each subsequent installation becomes a lot, a much easier decision. Um, and so I think, uh, it could be a real opportunity for um, uh, companies selling into the insurance industry. Great. And I think it's positive also, Wally, that, you know, from my perspective, we haven't seen like the massive budget cuts and innovation yet in you know, the large insurers. Like they still believe in it and they still want to drive it forward. They realize it's the way of the future in this digital world, this digital ecosystem that we're going to be in. So they're continuing to kind of invest in it and you know, invest in insure techs or invest in, you know, internally also on different you know, resources. So I think they're like, you know, from an enterprise level, they still want to drive those kind of initiatives forward and continue to push in those path. Great. And, and Ryan, um, R3 works with, you know, industries, you know, outside of insurance, you know, supply chain, you know, banking and so on. And blockchain is often seen as this trust foundational layer. How have other industries performed in a in using blockchain as a trust facilitator that perhaps insurance could take a, a look at? Yeah, it's really interesting. Like it's one of the hottest topics in markets right now is central bank digital policies. You know, and it's like we see central banks from all over the world focusing on this and really digitizing assets, digitizing tokens to start exchanging value. And it's like you have regulators supporting it, you have the large central banks, you have the bank ecosystem all to working together to do it. And pushing it forward so i say like you know in insurance it's like coming together bringing all the different players together bringing the regulator together because like you know the worst case scenario is that you get an application you know live and then a regulator comes down so it's like really working with the local clients to kind of push this forward is that our bell we're up <laughs> well, no, that, that was that was my that was my ping for um, pick up from school <laughs> i thought we were talking too long <laughs> we'll play everyone on the call <laughs> No worries, no worries. Well, uh, Maddie, we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna close this up. <laughs> so, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any final statements to take or uh, to make, or you, the audience, if you have any final questions that we can answer very quickly, please um, put it online, or else um, we're gonna move on to the uh, next uh, session, which is a deep dive with Rexio. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us, Walid. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Walid.